Welcome back, guys. So, in this book review, we are talking about Herbert Bix's Hirohito uh, and the making of modern Japan. So, as you can tell, probably from the cover, this is fairly beat up. I think I've read it like four or five times now. As a wannabe Japanologist who wants to eventually focus on Nazi German Imperial Japanese relations, I love this book. So, let's get going with this. So, Tackling the uh, late Showa Emperor, because he's no longer with us, um, or Hirohito, to use his actual name, is difficult, and Bix makes it fairly clear. In fact, that's probably something of an understatement. So, the core debate in the literature on Hirohito, not necessarily biographies, uh, but, you know, literature on modern Japan and the Second World War as well, is over whether or not Hirohito, the Showa Emperor, was an active leader in Japan's military actions during the wartime years, or whether he took more of a back seat. It's an investigation that's made much more difficult uh, due to the fact that because he was the emperor and because he's a member of the imperial family, there are certain documents about Hirohito that are not available for historians or for other investigators to actually look at and read. Um, so with that limited evidence available, Bix's Hirohito in the Making of Modern Japan makes use of the sources that we do have in an attempt to flesh out the emperor and his role in 20th century Japanese history. But even here, you know, the book is somewhat problematic. So the core thesis that this book argues is that due to the appointment of aggressive militaristic leaders uh, like Tojo, etc., and some aggressive laws and aggressive edicts, as well as some other key events during which the emperor issued instructions. Hirohito is not the backseat character that we sometimes conceive him as, but rather Hirohito was the central figure in Japan's leadership up to and during the Second World War. Now, this is not necessarily an incorrect interpretation um, but we do need to be extremely careful here. In modern legal terms, yes, technically Hirohito would probably have uh, been responsible for what happened during the war, but that's not how Japanese law and politics worked during the early 20th century. And we should then be careful, okay, in projecting our modern legal understandings back onto historical figures. In any case, this isn't really what the evidence suggests. Much of the documentation was decided beforehand and then issued in the presence of the emperor, the uh, imperial liaison conferences, when everybody gets together and kind of talks in the presence of Hirohito, and he maybe nods or says, hmm, etc., and then people have to maybe interpret that. Sometimes he does speak up, whereas if Bix's thesis you know, really does hold up, um, then we should see evidence of Hirohito fully taking charge, but he doesn't, at least not to the extent that you would really think. So, what's puzzling about this book, okay, is that, and this is where the academic consensus comes in, it's not praising the book necessarily, and not condemning it. The issue is more with the sources he uses um, than with the actual thesis itself, but at the end of the book, Bix's closing remarks are that despite the fact that there is some evidence that Hirohito does take active roles in some aspects of leading the war, um, you know, he does know about things like Nanking, and he knows about um, Unit 731, he apparently met Ishishiro at some point, and despite his transition from a war leader to a peaceful symbol of guidance and strength for the nation um, as Japan rebuilt itself after the Second World War, and the transition to a democracy, the office of emperor has continuously been used and manipulated by others in Japanese politics to further their own goals and missions, whether it be the conduct of a war in the name of the emperor, because that's what World War II was, it was a holy war in the name of Hirohito, or the transition to a democracy with the emperor's own blessing, which would appear to reject aspects of the thesis that, you know, he argues through much of his own work. Um, in a way, the older interpretation that Hirohito did the best he could with what he had available to him and who was around him may not maybe be so incorrect after all, but, but as it stands, Bix's biography, no matter the source problems, um, firmly establishes Hirohito as a central figure, if not the central figure, in modern Japanese history, and it's really impossible to understand the state without understanding Hirohito. But what exactly that role was still continues to be debated. 
The one key thing this book really does leave out, though, okay, is that Japan's conduct in the Second World War, and even before it, it's shaped by a forced course of action where the Japanese believed that becoming colonized or becoming a colonizer were the only options open to it. Now, this is not to condone what Japan does in terms of war crimes, um, but it's a crucial piece of context that's really missing from this book. So, because it's a biography of a controversial figure, you know, if I had to give this a 1, 2, or 3, 3 being the most difficult, 1 being like an intro level, I'm going to give this a 2. And if you decide to read it, I would highly suggest you do it alongside another work on modern Japanese history to get a fuller, uh, maybe more nuanced picture of the emperor and the era in which he lived. So that's it for now, guys. Like I said, this book is somewhat controversial due to the source material, but it's the best we've got right now on Hirohito, excluding the official biography on the man written by the uh, Imperial Household and the Imperial Archivists. So, until next time, everyone, take care. Hope you enjoyed this review. Consider picking the book up, and I will see you all next time.